Question for you. How many of you remember where you were on October the 22nd, 1962? <laughs> Some of you weren't alive. <laughs> <laughs> One year. <laughs> For those of us who this weekend are getting older, <laughs> I know exactly where I was that weekend. I was sitting in my family's den with my whole family around me, and on the screen was John F. Kennedy, and he was making announcement to the nation about Soviet missiles that had been discovered in Cuba, missiles that were close enough to reach America's shores. That was the first time that that had ever happened. And he was telling us about a naval blockade that he had had placed around Cuba, and he had made it clear that they would use military force if those missiles weren't withdrawn. And for 13 days, the United States held its collective breath as we waited to see what would happen. Now, if you remember those times, you remember that training films were hurriedly put out and nuclear fallout shelters were designated. And this was something I always found comical. We were taught to keep our toilets clean and our bathtubs clean because you could put water in those things and, and that way you'd have something to drink if, if our water lines were contaminated by nuclear fallout. Does anybody else find that ludicrous? I'm sorry. <laughs> We had nuclear warning drills that honestly scared us to death. And I remember as a kid that horrible siren going off and we would tear down the stairs to the gym which was under our school and we'd stand against the wall with our faces next to it and our hands over our heads as if that was gonna do any good. <laughs> but we did it because that was the only thing we knew how to do to control that very scary situation. Well, even though I didn't fully understand, you know, I was seven years old, um, I, was, I remember being afraid like I had never been afraid before. That sense of security that I had felt in my family and in all the things that we did, that was suddenly gone. And I was kind of looking out at that future, not, not knowing what that future was going to hold. As a seven-year-old, I had no concept of it, but I know I remember that fear and that tension. Now, why do I bring those things up? on this beautiful Memorial Day. One, we're grateful to those um, who face that, uh, those uncertain times every day, and for our benefit, they stand on those lines, prepared to die that we might live. We're grateful for that. But second, and perhaps more importantly here, Jesus talks about those things that will make us insecure in Matthew 24. He says there's gonna be wars and there are gonna be rumors of wars, See to it that you are not alarmed. Those things are going to happen. And the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, don't be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, even a seventh, seven-year-old's understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, maybe it's not a national security issue that threatens. Maybe it's a medical diagnosis. Maybe it's a financial crisis. There is always going to be something going on that threatens our well-being and our sense of peace, isn't there? And so how do we live without alarm as Jesus commands and at peace as Paul writes? Well, that's the question that Paul really is answering in that passage that you heard read today. And I would suggest to you that we have to know who we are. And that's the real answer to that question. And yes, we are not ducks, but we are what? Super. Superheroes. And we're being built into a temple who is part of Jesus' body. And we are most definitely family. We're all of those things. But in his most powerful illustration yet, Paul writes that we are soldiers, always prepared in defensive measures as well as offensive, and that every single one of those things is rooted in the truth of who we are. Does that make sense to you? Now, when Paul writes this last passage in Ephesians, he is most likely chained between two Roman guards. Can you imagine being his captors, stuck with the Apostle Paul? I wonder who the real captive was. 
I doubt it was Paul, but with those guards right beside him. Paul uses the imagery of their Roman armor to explain who we are and what we have in Jesus Christ. His words are meant to address every situation, and so he writes them so that you can stand. Because at the end of the day, we want to be left standing, don't we? All right, the first thing that Paul lists as our armor is the belt. And we didn't hear that in the message translation, but these are important. The first thing he lists is the belt, and it's a girdle-like leather belt. It was meant to support the soldier's core. Now, do you know what I mean when I say core? Okay, um, and so those of you who aren't nodding your heads, the core is that torso, that strength that when I... <laughs> I'll just tell you, when I was working out with a trainer, she would always endeavor to work on my core, my torso, because if that was strong, then it gave strength to the rest of my body. Okay. Well, that's one of those things that the belt did for the soldier, a little like the Home Depot back brace that they all, all wear. Okay, it protected their core so that they could work longer and harder and safer. But the belt had a um, greater purpose. Everything that the soldier needed was attached to that belt. His sword hung from it, his dagger was kept into it, and the breastplate that he wore to protect was actually attached to that belt so that it supported it and it didn't, you didn't bear all the weight on your shoulders because it would wear you out. Wearing that belt then, the soldier had every weapon at a quick disposal. Now what did Paul say that belt consists of? That's not a trick question. <laughs> it's the belt of what? The belt of truth. The truth. Now, <laughs> God's truth. Y'all have me scared this morning. I don't know. <laughs> it's truth. It's God's truth. Now, think about the connotations of that, because without truth, your weapons, of which you have several, they're not at the ready. It's a little bit like a policeman um, with an empty holster. You have no weapon at your disposal. Now, how does truth help us in any circumstance? Priscilla Shire wrote a really awesome book um, several years ago called The Armor of God, and she just went through all of those different pieces. And she writes this, that when we let God guide our decisions, then our decisions can be made in confidence because we make them listening to the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whose job is to guide us, speaking to the one who already knows about the future. Does that make sense to you? All right, and as we learn about the character and the purposes of God, then we can begin to trust him in every situation. As the word says, he is working all those things together for good, even when we can't see it, even when it doesn't look like it. And so that's what truth will do to you. And, and I love Priscilla Shire's analogy. She writes that truth is our very own personal homeland security. That's cool, isn't it? <laughs> And that's better than homeland security. I won't go any further. When we stand on truth, strength flows into every other area of our life. We have confidence in his promises, and that gives us courage and ability, the strength to do whatever is necessary in every situation. And that's going to bring confidence and security and peace, isn't it? It should. All right, the second piece of armor is the breastplate. The breastplate was a metal shield. It was usually made of bronze, so you can imagine how heavy that thing was. Can you imagine going into battle in that? No way. Um, it covered the neck all the way down to the thighs, and it was worn over this leather sheath-like garment. And sometimes a coat of mail um, was put over that, and the entire purpose was to protect the body's vital organs, especially the heart. Now, Proverbs 4.23 says to guard the heart above all else because it determines the course of your life. You know what the scriptures mean when they refer to your heart? It refers to all those things that make you uniquely you. Your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your will, your ambitions, your conscience. What we believe about ourselves then is critical. And we have an enemy that wants us to believe lies, such as the ones you were talking about, Dan. That life is not worth living. Um, that we're not anything that were garbage because of what we've seen and done. Those are some of those lies that the enemy wants to whisper to us, wants us to believe about ourselves and about the situations that we face. 
And Paul writes that that breastplate which protects our heart from those lies is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, righteousness is a judicial term. It means we have been declared not guilty, and we only have that righteousness through relationship with Jesus Christ. That gives us a right standing before God, a standing that should be, give us the confidence to make right, got my right choices in our lives. Now, how does that work? Let me give you an example. I have a friend who was falsely accused of wrongdoing about three years ago, and he was arrested and put in jail, and he's been going through that process for three years. Can you imagine waiting to see what the course of your life would be, not having necessarily the ability to determine it? So every day of those three years, he's been in waiting to see if he will be incarcerated or if he will be a free man. How would that affect the way you felt about you? It would be terrifying, wouldn't it? That would be a terrifying situation. You can't make plans. You're under suspicion. You know you're innocent, but the rest of the world has its doubts about you. Well, the good news is he was acquitted just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, thank you, Lord. And now he's free to make plans because his future has been determined. You know what? Because of Christ, so has yours. And so it's not just him that can walk free and walk into the future that's been planned for him. It's you as well. We don't have to be afraid about that future. It's already been determined. Does that make sense to you? Somebody ought to be shouting at this point. Thank you. That knowledge should guide every single decision that we make, and it is meant to give us peace in making them because we know what that future will be. Now, Roman soldiers were trained to fight in lines of battle. Part of their strength was in their ability to move forward together as an unstoppable wall. They were trained not to retreat, and there were two pieces of armor that helped them work together. The first were their shoes. Now, that's an odd piece of, <laughs> of armor, but think about it if you're in the military. you got boots you got to wear, don't you? <laughs> Um, these were specially made because if one soldier slipped or fell, it left an opening that the enemy could get through. And so they wore these hobnailed shoes. They were sandals with several layers of leather. And through them were pounded these nails. And those nails went into the ground and they kept them from slipping and falling no matter what that battlefield condition was, whether it was climbing up a mountain or sloshing through mud. Now Paul writes that our shoes... That which makes us stand firm is the gospel of peace. And what he means is that we can have that peace and assurance when we know our relationship with Jesus Christ is in the right place. And we can stand against any, anything, anything the enemy wants to throw at us, and the key is that relationship. You sense a common thread here? Okay. The second piece of armor that Roman soldiers used was a shield. <laughs> That little one that I had out here that kind of looked like a trash can lid, that's not the one he's talking about. Okay, there were two kinds of Roman shields. The one he's writing about is about two feet wide and about four feet long. It's probably longer than that. Um, and it was shaped like a door. And it was made of wood planks that are fused together. And then that wood was covered with first canvas and then leather. And iron was placed right in the center of it and all around the edges of it. So it was really strong um, and very little could get through it. Historians tell us that those shields were so large that a soldier could crouch down behind it and it would cover him. He would be completely safe. But often in battle, soldiers would be pelted with flaming arrows. And so they would dip their shields into water and they put the shields above their heads and then they would link those shields together. Don't miss the term together. They would link their shields together so that they could move forward together. It was called a turtle formation. And, and they could move forward together safe under those shields and the water would put out every flaming arrow that was sent at them. Now Paul writes that's what faith does for us. Because we usually see the weapons arrayed against us, don't we? Sometimes that's all we see, and we fail to recognize what we have at our disposal. But we can use those faith to protect us so that we don't panic and retreat, and rather they're meant to keep us moving forward. And here again, relationship with God is critical. But did you hear? It's also relationship with each other. 
that's critical. They linked shields together so that they could walk safely. Now, every once in a while, somebody will say to me, well, why do I need to go to church? Why do I need to be connected to a body of Christ? Isn't my faith enough? I believe in Jesus. I talk to him every day. And I would say this to you. Have you ever watched a, a lion hunt its prey? They hunt in a pack, and then they do what? They, they divide and conquer. They isolate one of whatever, whether it's a gazelle or, or any kind of a deer or whatever, an antelope, and then because that thing is alone and it has nobody else, nothing else around it, they can take it down. There's nothing. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> 1 Peter 5 says that we have an enemy, that he is like a roaring lion, that he, he roars looking for someone to devour. And we are vulnerable to the enemy on every side when we don't have the body of Christ around us. We need each other, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. The last piece of protective armor is the helmet of salvation. In Jesus' time, a Roman helmet covered most of the head. The only things that were exposed were the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, so that the brain was protected. As any doctor will tell you, one good blow to the brain, you can take out anybody. But those blows to the brain can also be thoughts that enter them. Now, the enemy cannot read our thoughts, but he can give faulty intelligence by whispering into our minds. Now we have to decide what we're going to do with that stuff that enters our minds. Sometimes they come in form of temptations. They come in the form of lies. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, gives us a battle strategy by which to defeat those things. It says, first, identify that thought or the thoughts that the enemy wants you to believe, that which is faulty, and you'll know it to be faulty because why? You hold it up against a standard, which is what? That's the truth. This is the word of God. And you'll know whether it's faulty or not. Second, where you believed that lie, confess it for what you know it to be. It is a lie. Third, take it captive. I love the language that he uses. He doesn't leave any doubt. He says, take that thing captive, say no to it, make the choice to believe truth, and bring your thoughts into submission with the truth of Jesus Christ. You hear there it is again. Bring it into the truth of Jesus Christ. Now that process is what Romans 12, 2 calls renewing the mind. And for those science nerds among us, the scientific word is neuroplasticity. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's the brain's ability to reorganize itself, to cause it not to run in the same old patterns, but it creates new patterns of thoughts. And so we can chart a new course by saying no to those thoughts and saying, no, I'm not going to believe this new, new course. I believe this. Adapting. Yes. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and so our minds can be protected. All right. The only offensive weapon that we have been given is the sword of the Spirit. And Paul identifies that as the Word of God. As you heard me talk with the kids Jesus used that very weapon when the enemy tried to get him to believe lies and to make decisions that would alter not only his destiny, but every single one of ours. We have the same enemy. You know that, right? We also have the same weapon. You know that, right? That's why this is so critical. Because if we don't know it and we don't read it, or if we choose to not put on our, tr our trust in it, it's not going to do us a bit of good. Is it? Now, again, a helpful example. When we were stationed in Germany, my husband was the commander of Checkpoint Alpha, and that was the border between what was then East and West Germany, and the soldiers at the checkpoint were to guard that point of entry, and so they were issued firearms. But because they were afraid of international incident, they weren't given any ammunition. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, so those weapons were purely for show. This is not for show. Don't put it on your coffee table and expect that it's going to protect you. Read it. Open it. Choose it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you are a soldier, and you've been given a mighty weapon. Pick it up and use it. <laughs> the last instructions that Paul writes to us as soldiers. 
is that we have been given the very best means of communication possible, that of prayer. If those lines are down, they can be repaired in a second by coming back into right relationship with Jesus Christ. All of those pieces of armor, all of those things that we have been given are meant to speak peace to us in every situation. And they are all utterly dependent on what we have been given in Jesus Christ, aren't they? And so in every situation that we face, every time we face the difficult, what's the best thing that we can do? And you guys can come on up here and get ready. What's the best thing we can do? Pray without ceasing. Talk to Him. We call to mind every promise that's been made. We stand on those promises because none of those things are for show. They're meant to protect you. They are meant to give you security. They're meant to bring you peace. Put those things on your lips. Put praise of God in your mouth and move. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to sing a song called We Believe. It talks about those things we believe.